Okay, so let's have a look at uh, shortest path routing. So this is an example of a link state routing protocol. Um, so in practice with this, rather than doing this whole um, Dijkstra's algorithm uh, over uh, in, in one whole go, so that the switch will compute its routing table directly from the LSPs that it's collected, um, often using an incremental form of the algorithm. So specifically, the switches will look after two things, like the tentative list and the confirmed list of nodes. Uh, so each of these will have a destination uh, and a cost and the next hop uh, to get there. So if we start this out by uh, looking at the, um, uh, we have a confirmed list that has only the node itself in there, right? It knows definitely it can get to itself at a cost of zero. Uh, then for the node that we just added to the confirmed list uh, in the previous step, so this is uh, itself initially, um, call it node next and look at its LSP. So now we look at the LSP initially of itself, and then for each neighbor of that, calculate the cost to reach the neighbor. Um, and again, as we saw with Dijkstra's algorithm, this is going to be the, the sum of our own cost to get there and the cost to get to that neighbor uh, from there. So if this discovers a new neighbor who is neither on the confirmed or on the tentative list, then we need to add that computed cost to the tentative list. Um, and we say that the next hop to get there um, is the direction that we need to go to get there. Because again, as we do this repeatedly, we're not just looking at ourself and immediate neighbors, we start looking at neighbors of ourselves and neighbors of them and neighbors of neighbors of neighbors of neighbors of neighbors. Um, right, so if the neighbor is already on the tentative list when we add it in, rather than if it was neither on the confirmed nor the tentative list, and if it's uh, cheaper, the, uh, if it's a cheaper option to get to that uh, node, uh, then we replace that entry for that node with the cheaper entry, right? So again, this is, we think back to what we're talking about with Dijkstra's algorithm. It's always replacing more expensive paths with cheaper ones uh, as we go through. Um, and so if the tentative in, uh, list is empty, then we stop. We've actually gone through the entire network. Um, otherwise, we pick the entry from the tentative list that has the lowest cost because there can now be no lower cost path to get to that node. And we move it to the confirmed list. And then we go back up to step two, using that node that we just moved to the confirmed list um, and call that node next and repeat this process, right? So we, we will work out for ourselves and then we work out for our cheapest neighbor. And then we work out for the cheapest node that is either one of our neighbors or one of our neighbor's neighbors. And so again, it's always going out following the cheapest path until it's propagated all the way out through the network uh, and covered the entire network. Uh, and so thus is implementing uh, Dijkstra's algorithm. So let's have a look at this uh, in practice. So imagine we have a network like this. Um, so this cross here in the middle is not a connection, right? So A has a link to C of cost 10. B has a link to D uh, of cost 11, but there's no uh, direct, uh, you know, the, the direct paths from um, a and C to B are actually via these other paths. Okay, so initially in step one, um, so if we're doing this as node uh, D, um, so D says, I know definitely I can get to myself uh, at a cost of zero. So then it will say, okay, who are my neighbors? My neighbors are B and C. It will add the paths to those um, to the tentative list. So the cost to, for D to get to D is zero. So it adds 11 to that to get to B and says, okay, the cost to get to B is 11. Likewise, zero plus two to get to C is two. So it says, okay, at this point, this is what I've calculated. Then it will, uh, in the next step, we say, okay, what is the lowest cost uh, node in the tentative list? That's the path to C. Because we can see this is taking the, it's taking the cheapest path, right? To see if there's any other cheaper ways to get places. Uh, so now uh, it will uh, look at that and say, okay, who are the neighbors of C um, and calculate the costs there. So from C, we can get to A at a cost of 10. So 2 plus 10 makes 12. And we can get to B at a cost of 5 of 2 plus 3. Ah, but B was already in the tentative list. But our cost of 5 is better than the cost of 11 that was already there. 
So we replace that entry. So we say we don't go directly from D to B at a cost of 11 anymore. Even though this is more hops, we will go to D from D to B via C because the cost is only two plus three is five. So we've replaced that with a lower cost link. So now we've gone through all of the neighbors of C. So now we take the lowest cost uh, entry from the tentative list, so that's to B, and we put that in the confirm. There can be no cheaper way to get to B now than that. Uh, so B, uh, we then have a look at. Uh, so B's neighbors uh, has a link to A, and that link will cost five, which is our cost to get to B, plus five more to get to A. So we now have a path to get to A that costs 10, which is cheaper than the previous path we added in the, uh, in the previous round where we added the cost to, uh, path to A, which costs two plus 10 is 12. Now we're saying we can go two plus three plus five is a cost of only 10. So now we've looked at all of B's neighbors, and of course D was already a neighbor of B. So we, it was already in the confirm list, so we didn't need to add it uh, in again. And so now we take the lowest cost entry from the tentative list, that's the path to A, put it in the confirm list. There are no entries left in the tentative list. Therefore, we've now computed the optimal routing table. And you can have a look at that, and you can actually see there is no cheaper way to get to any of the nodes. And we've avoided these two expensive links uh, that go across the network in favor of this cheaper path around the edge. Uh, and it's correctly detected that without us having to do all of the possible comparisons. Okay, so um, OSPF, Open Shortest Path First, uh, is a routing protocol that uses and implements uh, a link state uh, routing protocol. So um, we have a, um, an OSPF um, header uh, that, again, is uh, not a great deal of surprise in there. There's authentication mechanisms and things so that we can have a little bit of security against Byzantine uh, nodes. So that means so when we talk about Byzantine robustness, uh, in an algorithm, we mean robustness against where there are naughty uh, nodes or naughty participants trying to uh, uh, you know, to mess it up or with um, uh, mischievous intent. And so then for each link, it will advertise information about uh, the link. So we have some age information, we have the link state ID, um, we have information about who's advertising it, uh, sequence number again so that we can uh, update these things, uh, check someone's length, uh, the number of links that are then in the remainder of the uh, the packet. And then for each link, we have a link ID, uh, information about the link, uh, the cost, uh, and uh, uh, further optional information. So you have more of these as you go through. And so again, this provides the information that's needed uh, to implement uh, the link state algorithm with this. Okay, so we're just about to the end of the chapter. If we want to think about how uh, routing and switching is implemented on modern networks, this is typically done uh, using specialized hardware now. So a modern switch will often have, so in this case, we might have a 48 port, uh, 40 gigabit. Uh, so this is SFP, so that's um, fiber uh, connections. And then it will have uh, the switch fabric uh, interconnect. And so it will receive the, um, uh, the frames in and it will have very fast static RAM to hold those packets. So they can have very low latency accessing them and it will uh, have its forwarding pipeline to work out where things need to get forwarded. Uh, and then it will have a bunch of patterns that it will be using to apply to work out where to do the, the forwarding and then feed things back through. And the CPU that's in there is really just to control and to update, for example, the patterns to match. Uh, so the bulk of it is actually happening in dedicated hardware um, to get that very high speed switching uh, and in parallel as well. Okay, so um, if we look overall, then stepping back a, a bit more. So um, networks have been around for a, a long time, many decades. The virtualization of networks has been around now for about 20 years or so. So using VLANs and VPNs so that you can seg you know, dis you can separate the physical structure of the network from the logical structure of the network. Um, for about you know, 20 odd years, this has been 
uh, coming along. And so again, for things like cloud computing, this is important where you need to indeed abstract over the physical network uh, to provide a, a logical network structure. And so uh, virtualizing networks indeed to support things like clouds has come about more recently with the idea of software defined networking that makes it much easier to define uh, these network environments uh, independent of the underlying uh, structure uh, of, you know, of the network. And so then virtual networks are now much easier uh, with uh, SDN to actually uh, to deploy, to manage, to take down again. Um, and again, so this is analogous to virtual machines. So virtual machines is allocating the computing resources uh, in this abstract manner. So we say, oh, I need 10 computers and 10 CPUs. Uh, I don't care which data center or how they're physically uh, where they're physically located. And I want a network that has this structure that connects them. I don't care what the underlying network looks like. So virtualizing machines and virtualizing networks allows this flexibility uh, in the use of resources. Uh, and of course, when anything moves from the hardware to the software domain, it becomes much more flexible and agile and adaptable uh, to respond uh, to the needs. So again, this is why that's uh, really been driven. And so now we have lots of companies that have business models that are based on virtual machines uh, and virtual networks. So you have companies like uh, Airbnb, uh, for example, who I believe are simply using uh, cloud facilities to run their entire business. Um, and uh, they certainly were in the past and lots of other startups tend to do this because again, they can scale up and scale down in response to uh, dynamic uh, needs and requirements uh, quite readily. And they don't have to become experts at running the physical computers and the physical networks. Uh, they can be abstracted uh, above that and just focus on their business. Okay, so uh, if we then step back further again uh, and think, you know, we've looked at how to build networks that are composed of different, or inter-networks that are composed of different networks that may be using the same or different types of networks. They can be um, heterogeneous. We use switches and routers to connect these and to be able to make uh, the links between these networks to make internetworks, uh, and then we have to have internetworking protocols. So most commonly, IP, the internet protocol, uh, to actually facilitate uh, this kind of connection. Uh, we had a look at a, a couple of the main uh, classes of routing algorithms, so distance vector and link state, uh, and saw how they work and the different ways that they actually achieve the same goal of finding the uh, the most uh, efficient. Uh, path between nodes on the network. And so that's it uh, for this uh, chapter. Uh, hopefully that's given you a, a bit of an idea about what's happening at that uh, networking layer in the, uh, the OSI uh, network stack uh, and it's equivalent for uh, the internet. And it really is, you know, what we've covered here is kind of the heart of how the internet works in many ways. Everything that's above that is how we can use the internet better and more conveniently and more comfortably uh, to do the kind of things that we want to do with that. So that we will pick up uh, in the next chapter.